that. And there was also, there's also a study, I think it was like, they looked at like going back to the fiber thing. There's like 2000, um, colonoscopies that they did. And they looked at all the different sort of factors that, that went into, uh, diverticulosis. And they looked at, you know, meat consumption, fat consumption, constipation, and fiber, numbers of bowel motions, all these different parameters. They found the only things that correlated with uh, the development of diverticulosis were increased fiber consumption and increased number of bowel motions a day. And they found it was actually sort of uh, six, 700% increased correlation between those. Constipation did not, you know, a traditional hard, you know, you know uh, on the Bristol stool chart, uh, constipation. Well, I'm surprised making... there wasn't an inverse relationship between fiber consumption and constipation. But the way I explain it in my lecture is like, yeah. so you've got the anal sphincter, it's a small hole. Mm -hmm. Now, the solution, if you're trying to pass something through a small hole, the solution isn't to make it bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if, if you've got, if you've got an, uh, an arterial road, a main arterial road, and you've got a traffic jam, you don't help the traffic flow by adding more cars. Yeah. Well, I think it does. I mean, I think that uh, this, this study didn't look into that in particular, but like, I mean, you certainly see this, you know, you you get uh, like neurogenic uh, colons and things like that. And there are people on a bunch of medications and they get just these big um, intestinal obstructions. There's just mm. blocks of wood, really, you know, there's just like a ton of fiber and they get dried out and they just have this huge, you know, mass and uh, and they can't go anywhere, you know. And if you're wondering what causes diverticuli, so these are little uh, bulgings out of the colon. I mean, we just know from physics that uh, if you double the radius, you know, that then the pressure is increased by that to the power of four. I think so. It, it's uh, the wall stresses it, when you start to increase the diameter of whatever is transiting through the colon. There is a massive increase in wall pressures, so it, it's very likely that these uh, diverticuli. The, the out pouchings uh, uh, are basically subject a cause of mechanical stress. Yeah. And like, I, I sort of think of it in the same way as like heart disease, you know, where you have, you're, you're working against this high pressure gradient for years and years and years and years. And then the, the organ just eventually fails, you know, you get left heart failure. And I sort of think of that with, with this study would sort of demonstrate that, that you're overworking the colon, you're, 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 I mean, it's massive, you know, increasing the diameter, increasing the amount of bulk that they have to pass through and also mm. increasing the number and frequency of it a day. And you just sort of, you just run out of juice and these, and these, this organ just fails. That's why I sort of think of it as, as colon failure, as, you know, it's similar to uh, heart failure. Well, I think just also, look, I, I don't know if I, you know, totally agree with that, but right. I think one thing that we overlook with the intestines, and this is where inflammatory bowel disease is so important, especially on a carnivore-style diet, is that we have functions such as processing of fructose and synthesis of HDL cholesterol that occurs in the intestines. Mm -hmm. So we often see people with a, you know, a poor HDL level and we, we want to blame saturated fat and so on and so forth. But if you're having trouble synthesizing HDL, you need to understand, well, some of it is synthesized in the intestines. And if you've got inflammatory bowel disease, that can impact on the intestinal function. Mm. Uh, also fructose absorption. So I have incorrectly in previous lectures, I've sort of been parroting the, the mantra that we understood at the time that uh, fructose basically, you know, had no, no safety margin for consumption within the body. We, we had no capacity to store it as glycogen as we do with glucose and so on and so forth. But as it turns out, the intestines can actually process, metabolize fructose for us. So, mm -hmm. and I think that's one of the significant reasons why when people go on a, on a, a strict elimination diet, which would be a, an all meat diet, and they improve their gastrointestinal health, we often see these significant improvements in metabolic health occurring coincidentally so it, it's impossible to tease them apart so you know I, I track hundreds of patients results and we often see that when the inflammatory markers are improving their metabolic markers are improving at the same rate nice and, oh sorry uh, say. yeah so i think there's just a whole lot more to the intestinal function that we we don't understand so uh, I don't know if you've ever, you know, gotten into the incretin effect, the GIP and GLP-1. Uh, these are absolutely fascinating. And they, these are actually uh, uh, basically, uh, they're called incretins. They're basically little signaling hormones um, that have more impact on insulin release than blood sugar levels themselves. 
And bile acid, for example, is one of the factors that leads to a strong, it, it, it travels down the gastrointestinal tract and you've got receptors uh, in the distal small intestine that will stimulate the release of glucagon-like peptide. And it's basically a balance. Um, you've got uh, GIP1 proximally, GL, uh, GIP, sorry, proximally and G, GLP1 more distally. And if you're consuming something that is incredibly readily digested or broken down rapidly, then it can stimulate the early one, but not stimulate the later one. And the later one is actually what is better for metabolic health. And interestingly, when you're looking at these weight loss injections that it's taken the world by storm at the moment, they're basically GLP-1 analogs. They're basically imitating the action of GLP-1, <laughs> which is basically what a, uh, a good ketogenic diet should do. It's exactly the same mechanism. So you can pay a lot of money for an injection that isn't available anyway, or you can just eat healthy. Yeah. But uh, I think we're, there's a lot more that we're going to learn in coming years about the gastrointestinal functions and how that relates to metabolic health and cardiovascular health. Yeah, it sounds like it. I mean, it, it, we're, we're, I mean, even just like the microbiome and, and all the different sorts of you know functionalities that we're just. Well, I'm, I'm skeptical like, on the microbiome. I, yeah. I think that's a, I think that's a lot of noise and a lot yeah. of pseudoscience <laughs> at the moment. I, I think we've just gone far ahead of the science. So, I yeah. mean, what we do know, we're, we've got decades of data on patients who have been on ketogenic diets with epilepsy. So when they analyze their microbiome, they show we, we, we separate the microbiome into two phyla. So we've got the bacteroidetes and the firmicutes. And we know that uh, there's a prominent, I believe there's a predominance now, I haven't looked at this in a, some time, but uh, the bacteroidetes is actually greater in people with good metabolic health, it also happens to be greater on people on ketogenic diets. Because basically your microbiome eats what you eat. And we know that bacteria thrive and survive on their preferred nutrient. So when you consume a particular kind of nutrient, that's going to feed a particular kind of bacteria. And as you know, bacteria proliferate and they divide and double incredibly rapidly. So we've done studies on microbiomes where they, today, We'll take a sample. Tonight, you eat this meal that you don't normally eat. We'll change your diet. 24 hours later, we'll take the microbiome again. It will be completely different. So people are thinking it's so causative, but what it is, it's actually associational. So a particular microbiome just reflects your metabolic health because the microbiome changes with your diet. There's some other brilliant examples. I don't know if you've heard of trehalose. It's an artificial sweetener that is put into dairy because of its impact on freezing point. Now, I'm a little sketchy on the exact dates, but about the year 2000, uh, the Japanese scientists actually managed to refine a process which it could be produced on an industrial scale, and then it progressively began to get introduced into food supplies around the world. So it's in frozen dairy, so things like ice cream and frozen yogurts. Now, if you understand that some bacteria uh, prefers to eat certain foods. There's one particular kind of bacteria called Clostridium difficile that's got a particular, it's particularly fond of trehalose. Now, this is the bacteria that leads to a condition called pseudomembranous colitis, which is a life-threatening. It's one of the one of the emergencies that we have in gastrointestinal uh, diseases that will kill you and kill you quickly. And there's ever since trehalose was introduced into the food supply there's been whatever country it's been introduced into that's been followed by an epidemic of this condition pseudomembranous colitis related to this bug the clostridium difficile bug just simply liking the fact that it could eat a lot of the you know it, it eats trehalose very nicely another example is that um if you've ever looked at the research on probiotics for treating or preventing traveler's diarrhea so i've just told you that you know, if you don't feed the bugs in your gut, their preferred diet, then they'll die. So when you take these uh, probiotics, these are basically bugs. The only way they've been shown to work in preventing traveler's diarrhea is if you constantly consume them at quite high dose regularly, because otherwise the population is just displaced, it dies out. Mm -hmm. And when, when it's gone, then it can no longer displace the pathogenic bacteria. So I first came across a study several years ago. There's a condition called necrotizing enterocolitis, which is a life-threatening illness, infection of the intestines that often affects premature infants, newborn infants. 
And they did a study in India and they came up with a probiotic that they hoped a bacteria that was not dangerous, that they hoped would prevent these dangerous bacteria getting a foothold. And they found that when they gave the babies this, uh, uh, this probiotic by itself, it didn't prevent necrotizing enterocolitis. So then they came up with the concept, well, they, they were smart. They said, well, it's because we need, to, we need to feed the bacteria what it needs so it can gain a foothold. So they developed, uh, they came up with a term called a symbiotic uh, for synergy, where they also provided a, uh, a carbohydrate, I believe it was, a sugar that that particular bacteria would like to consume. And they gave it as a combination. And when they gave it as a combination, it was very effective. So you have to understand that, you know, even if you consume a probiotic, uh, if you're not feeding it its particular foodstuffs, it's just going to die off and the other bacteria are going to take its place. Now, in some cases, there may be a role, um, you know, fecal microbiota transplants and stuff like that is an interesting area. But by and large, the science of probiotics is a long way behind what the claims are being made. I'll, I'll, I'll just give you some, an example. So a pharmacist, a friend of mine, so these are, you know, you go into the chemist and you'll see you've got these refrigerators full of all their refrigerated probiotics. So they're obviously the good ones because they need to be kept cold. And he said to me, actually, that's nothing but a marketing stunt. He said, there's no reason, they're all freeze dried. There's no reason why it actually needs to be kept refrigerated. Um, we just do that for marketing. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you're kidding, right? And I haven't read any, nobody's obviously gonna publish any papers on that. So I can't attest to the absolute veracity of that. Um, but certainly that was uh, what he was led to believe by the, uh, the company, the, the salespeople of the company. And uh, I've probably just got one more story on the abuse of science with probiotics. Um, I just have to be a little bit careful about exactly how much I say, but let, let, uh, well, we, won't, we won't give any brand names or anything away. Um, but there is a probiotic that is very popular and it's, it's a million, multi-million dollar market for treating and preventing inflammatory bowel disease. It's a very, it's a propriety blend. Uh, anybody who's ever worked, uh, any doctor would, who's worked in gastrointestinal health will know about it. Um, and it's quite expensive. Now, the interesting thing is that the study on which this propriety blend of probiotics has been shown to be beneficial, I think had six participants. So a friend of mine, who I shan't name, did some research. He, he teamed up with the company here, they gave him product, and he did some, a larger scale study on the efficacy of this supplement. And he found it was worthless. It didn't do anything at all. Mm -hmm. When he went to publish, he was threatened with legal action. To date, this data has never seen the light of day. There's still thousands of people out there every day consuming this probiotic, thinking that it's doing good for them on the basis of a study of six participants when I, there's better, better research out there that has been hidden. I actually, I actually heard about that. I, I ran into... Uh, I believe the person you're talking about at um, uh, ah, yeah, he was there. The Gold Coast. He was, yeah, yes, yes, yeah. And he actually he told me about that. And we'll, we'll keep everyone on uh, quiet. But it was it was I, I believe it was uh, at least one of the institutions was here in Perth, and um, and they, and they had all the data. And so apparently the, the abstract is is still available. So you can you can find the abstract, but, ah. but everything else is is uh, is gone. It's hidden, so it can't be published. But the abstract is available online. And uh, yeah, that's that's wild. And like yeah, they. They found and the, they, the public has no idea. The wider no. public has no idea how the scientific process is abused in medicine to tell the narrative that mm -hmm. that uh, large forces want to be want to have told. Yeah, no, it's 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 really really bad. And I and then even when you you do have real research going out, you have the the waters muddied by a lot of this industry research that that puts out a bunch of you know conflicting data out there and then you say oh well you know on balance i mean there's 30 studies that say this is good for you 30 studies that say it's bad for you like oh what well, do you know i guess we just need some more studies like no <laughs> if you stopped uh, you know if, if if every you know all 30 of the you know the good for you studies come from the company trying to sell you the product you know you have to be a little suspect and the, all the other ones say that it's bad for you you know, I think I know what I'm going to just like err on the side of caution of and, um, no, but it is very bad. And that's the problem because people, 
I think that's the thing is just people just aren't cynical enough these days. They just, they just really have this faith in humanity that everyone just wants the best for everyone. It just, it simply isn't true. And, you know, people are out for their own interests and, and you, and if you understand that, you understand how human nature works, then you can survive and everyone can, can be happy in that, but you need to protect yourself as well. Well, many of my patients will attest that what I like to tell them is that nobody cares about you mm -hmm. more than you. And that's a simple fact. And that even me as their doctor, I have conflicts of interest mm -hmm. and they're not always visible. And I, I try to be honest about them, but generally that my conflicts of interest uh, hinge around, uh, you know, what, what could, uh, you know, be considered reasonable medicine and basically me covering myself. So mm -hmm. I, uh, I draw a very fine line. I don't tell people what they should do. Uh, when it goes against guidelines, but I will educate them as to the science. So I think um, if I'm presenting the patient with peer reviewed science, I think I'm on solid ground. But at the end of the day, so uh, up and, you know, often say people want to have a firm recommendation, you know, do I need to take the statin or do I not need to take the statin? Obviously, that's going to put me on a Medico legally, you know, thin ice sometimes if we say stop taking the statin and a cardiologist an expert cardiologist told them to take the statin so i won't do that but mm -hmm. i'll also say well nobody cares about you more than you you're going to have to make up the own decision it's called informed consent let me show you the evidence this is the evidence of benefit this is the evidence of harms now you make the decision yeah